right, just give me one second to hit go for the live feed. This meeting is going to air on WCTV. So just one second. <clears throat> Okay. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, I'm starting off the, the meeting with uh, the reading of the governor's order. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general laws, chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order, <coughs> imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting of the Wilmington Conservation Commission is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Members of the public who would like to participate in the meeting via Zoom can do so by clicking on the public link. Members of the public who would like to listen to this meeting while in progress may also do so via telephone by dialing 1-646-558-8656 and enter meeting ID 849-5590-1. Then press pound and press pound again at the next voice prompt. Members of the public attending this meeting virtually will be allowed to make comments if they wish to do so during the portion of the hearing des designated for public comment. By following the steps previously noted, then press star nine on their telephone keypad. This will notify the meeting host that the caller wishes to speak. In the event that despite our best efforts, we are not able to provide for real-time access, we will post a record of this meeting on the town's website as soon as we are able. Amen. Uh, so I'll call this meeting to order. It's 7.06. And the first item on the agenda is a request for a determination for 32 Cary Street. Mr. Chairman, if you wouldn't mind, before we get to that one, just to do a quick roll call of the members. That's right. It's been a month. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, uh, Vinny, are you there? Here. Good. Laura, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Ron? Muted. I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Ron. Tom? Yes, I'm here. Mike? Present. Um, myself, Don Pearson, here. Thanks for the reminder, Valerie. Sure. OK, carrying on then, uh, the RDA for 32 Cary Street. So uh, this is an RDA for an after the fact uh, tree removal. Um, on the property, there were five trees cut down inside the buffer zone. Um, and this is, um, you know, a remedial, um, kind of an act to the fact. So. <laughs> um, I think the applicant is here tonight if, um, and I can pull up the, um, the plan on the screen if that's helpful. Um, okay. And maybe the applicant, could you um, go maybe go over the um, the proposal and um, the location of the trees? Yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Tony Montanello from 32 Cary Street. I'm the homeowner. 
<laughs> this is, uh, as Cameron mentioned, after the fact, um, five trees were removed. All were in the buffer zone. Um, however, uh, not in the bordering uh, vegetated wetland area. The five trees, um, as in the delineation report, uh, some of them were diseased. Uh, they are part of a fairly densely forested part of the area. And the trees removed are along the length of and within five to 10 feet of uh, active use areas, the driveway, fence, um, the lawn area, and then the shed. Um, and some large branches in the past have come down and that was the reason for taking them down uh, with some of the uh, prior things uh, to avoid. So just requesting um, the approval of the RDA uh, due to those posing a safety hazard due to the significant overhang and encroachment. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, <clears throat> uh, Cam, anything more? No, he, he hit everything. Um, he hit all, the, all my points. Okay. Um, let's go through the commission. Um, Penny, how do you feel? I don't have a problem. Uh, Laura? No questions. How about you, Ron? I, I just wondered how, 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 how far from the LA. Uh, what? Uh, that, uh, that, that question didn't come across. Uh, would you read it one more time, please? The, the question is how, how far were the trees from the uh, uh, bordering wetlands? themselves okay. 99 feet or uh, 20 feet Tony you got a sense of that yes I believe they were in the approximate range of a, about 20 feet and further out Yeah, there's 20, one was 37. Uh, there was another one that was about 22. It's hard to tell from the uh, winter photographs um, just what sort of shade is left. Is it your opinion that, they, that there will still be dense shade, so less need to replace these trees or? Oh, uh, yes, actually, as part of the um, prior meeting, we did have, as part of the package, um, did have a fully, um, you know, fully during the, um, during the season photograph overhead showing all of the, uh, all of the other trees in that area. It's, it's densely populated. Actually, some of these trees due to the other um, trees that were there that were much more mature and larger were actually starting to bend and encroach onto the um, like driveway fence and toward the toward the house. Thank you. Tom, um, how about you? No questions. Mike. No questions. Uh, if I remember correctly, Tony, we we discussed the possibility of planting uh, a few shrubs in there, something at a lower altitude than the than the trees themselves. Uh, that's still something that would be useful if you choose to do so. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes, I, I just I'm sorry. sorry. I just pulled up the um, the images that are a little bit clearer from the last meeting, um, so hopefully that's helpful. Yes, thank you. Um, some definitely open to uh, planting. Some I usually do anyways. A lot of, um, but if you could just scroll toward the next one, mm -hmm. in the other direction actually. Yeah, that's the overhead shot. So the some of the trees were actually these that were overhanging the driveway, you can see all mm -hmm. the remainder will still uh, provide a uh, si significant amount of coverage. As far as planting along the line with the, um, I think the next, 
couple of slides, maybe the next one. Although this is kind of in, in the fall winter time, as you can see toward the left of this photograph, the type of um, brush that's there and berries, that actually does extend all along this line of where the lawn area is. Mm -hmm. um, it's although it doesn't come through right there, it's fairly dense and pretty much creates a natural fence and barrier to the um, to the to the area. But there are always there are I'm open to it and um, have done it on just on my own in the past as well. Okay, I, I think that we are comfortable with the. Um, amount of shade that's still there, but you, you know, that's uh, something that can still be um, useful for the wildlife to have the uh, lower level shrubs in there as well. And, and they don't have to be along the border. They can be, you know, in a bit near the stumps or around there. So, but anyway, that's, that's really a, the only comment I have. Um, so I, I, I think we could move to, uh, to a vote then. Um, let's, let's see, I think we also have the public option. Is that true? Yeah, if you'd like okay. to ask the public if there's any comments, sure. um, they can raise their hand or um, speak up. I don't think we have any comments. Okay. So could I have a motion to uh, issue a, is it a negative three? Negative three. To request uh, for a negative three determination for 32 Cary Street, please. <clears throat> so moved. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ron, uh, for the vote. Vinny? I'm OK with it. Laura? Yes. Ron? OK. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. And Don, yes. Good. Thanks, Tony. You're all set. Thank you, everyone. And uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. you too. The next item on the agenda is an, a request for determination for 201 Lowell Street. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Brittany Gessner. I'm a civil engineer with VHB, and I'm here on behalf of the applicant Textron Systems on this um, RDA. Uh, here with me tonight, I also have Sarah French, who is a wetland scientist with VHB. Um, I'll introduce the project and then she'll discuss a little bit more the, the wetland resource areas um, adjacent to the pro proposed project. We also have Alec White with Cushman and Wakefield and Cindy Murphy Gibson with Margulies uh, Peruzzi Architects. Um, if okay, I'll share my screen. We have prepared just a, a brief presentation to help illustrate the proposed project. <clears throat> All right. Um, so as I mentioned, on behalf of the applicant, uh, VHB has submitted a request for determination of applicability for a relatively small HVAC upgrade project um, to an existing external storage area on the site. Um, just for reference, uh, concurrently, we did submit a request for a waiver from site plan review with the planning board, which they did grant um, last evening during their hearing. Um, so the site is a 61 acre property that is bounded by Lowell Street, Main Street, and uh, Maple Meadow Brook, which runs through the middle of the site. The site is currently developed with seven buildings, about 1,200 surface parking spaces, and a pertinent infrastructure throughout the site that support operations. Um, 
Maple Meadow Brook does run through the middle of the site and there's a fairly, fairly extensive wetland system that's associated with that brook. And then the western leg of the site is a recreational area which includes several tennis courts and baseball diamonds. Um, the property has been under the same ownership since about the 50s and virtually all of this development was put in in about the 50s with the exception of one building, the westernmost building which went in um, in the 80s. The project is near the centroid of the site right within um, this red box. There is an external storage site that is um, really nestled within the existing wetland system and that was constructed in the 50s uh, with the original development of the site. So this image here uh, taken from Google Earth, it shows uh, the external storage area, which is an above ground uh, series of concrete vaults. You can see on the left side, the vertical concrete face where you enter, um, where you can enter inside the vaults. And then on the back side, uh, the vaults are covered with earth and vegetated with grass. Surrounding this area, um, you can see is a paved access driveway. And then just to the left um, of that paved access driveway are the resource, uh, the wetland resource areas. Um, you can also see the maintenance, the existing maintenance shed uh, near the bottom of the screen, which I'll, I'll reference later. Um, the project, uh, there's an existing HVAC system within the maintenance shed, which provides um, temperature and humidity control to those storage vaults. Uh, there's also underground existing ductwork, which runs from the maintenance shed to those vaults. Um, recently, the HVAC system has failed, and per the state fire marshal's orders, uh, the Textron needs to repair that to maintain temperature and humidity control within these vaults. Um, it is also worth noting that the existing underground ductwork between the maintenance shed um, and the vaults has, has failed due to uh, water uh, leaks and, and water entering into the ducts. So um, that's worth noting as well. Um, so th there's really six components of the project. I'm going to walk you through each of those components and then I'll pass it off to Sarah and she'll discuss in more detail the various uh, resource areas in the vicinity of the project. Um, so first, uh, the perimeter of the project, will, uh, there'll be silt sock erosion control barrier surrounding the entire perimeter of the project. You'll notice that this is inward of that existing paved driveway. Um, so the, the paved driveway is between the, the erosion control barrier and the project um, and then the wetland resource areas. Um, the first component of the project, also on this screen, you'll see the, the thin green line on the right hand side, that represents the 100 foot buffer zone. The thin blue line represents the riverfront, the 200 foot riverfront area, which again, Sarah will talk more about those, but just for reference. Um, so the first component of the project is uh, the applicant is proposing to install new underground conduit from the existing building, which is at the, the lower right hand corner um, that will travel underneath some landscaping, uh, an existing paved drive aisle and some more landscaping to connect to the existing maintenance shed. Um, once that conduit is installed, the, the surface treatment will be replaced in kind. And you'll note that that portion of the work is outside both the 100 foot buffer zone and the 200 foot riverfront area. The next component of the work is new HVAC equipment will be installed within the uh, existing maintenance shed, again, outside of the, the two buffer zones. Um, there's an existing concrete pad that will need to be increased by about 28 square feet to accommodate some of the new uh, HVAC equipment, again, outside of the buffer zones um, and that new impervious area is significantly negligible and will not change uh, the open space on the existing uh, 61 acre site. The last two items are the only two items within uh, buffer zone. Um, so as I mentioned previously, there is existing underground ductwork that goes from the maintenance shed um, to the vaults that has failed. Uh, it's full of water. Uh, it's really not usable any longer. So an attempt to reduce the amount of earth disturbance required for this project, the applicant is proposing overhead ductwork um, to replace that. And, and the existing underground ductwork will just be abandoned in place. Uh, so we don't need to disturb the earth to, to remove it or repair it. Um, the overhead ductwork will be, I just want to check my notes to make sure I get this right. 
Um, it will be supported uh, by two posts every six linear feet. Um, the post will interface with the ground via concrete blocks placed on top of crushed stone and filter fabric. There are no foundations uh, proposed to support that ductwork. And that ductwork does start to enter within the 200 foot riverfront area, um, as well as the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, and then there are four approximately six feet by six feet areas of temporary disturbance proposed. Uh, what we'll need to do is dig into that existing earth that covers the vaults um, to connect the overhead ductwork into the vaults. Um, so although we will be disturbing earth, it, it's earth that's above the concrete vaults. Um, and again, this is all previously disturbed uh, work when, when the, the storage area was installed. 70 years ago. Um, so with that, I'll pass it off to, uh, to Sarah French and she'll talk a little bit more about the existing resource uh, areas on site. Thank you. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, good evening, everybody. Again, for the record, Sarah French, um, wetland scientist with BHB. I'm just gonna walk through a little bit about um, what we found in the field when we flagged these wetlands. So the main, our main resource area on the site is Maple Meadow Brook. Um, which is a perennial riverine system that flows in a general south to north direction into a freshwater water pond to the west of the project site. Um, the brook becomes ponded to the northwest of the site where flow appeared to be blocked under the lower Lowell Street Bridge. We didn't see um, any beaver dam, but we did observe some freshly cut woody vegetation that indicates that beavers may be active near the site. Um, south of the ponded area, the bank of Maple Meadow Brook became pretty indistinct. So therefore the limits of mean annual high water were delineated based on bank, bank full field, field indicators, including a distinct change in vegetation um, community from emergent marsh to shrub forested wetland. Um, north and west of the pump house, the banks were well-defined and vegetated. The bank was uh, fairly steep with some large boulders um, and upland vegetated, uh, vegetation included mature white pine, oriental bittersweet, and multiflora rose. Um, we then had two bordering vegetated wetland areas. Wetland one is a fringe palestrian forested uh, wetland system adjacent to Maple Meadow, Meadow Brook, located, located at the west of the project site. Um, wetland one, uh, the 200 series connected into the bank of the ponded section of the brook that I mentioned at flags 200 and 204, which uh, are a little bit off of um, the, the picture that we have here. Um, common uh, wetland vegetation of wetland one included high bush blueberry, red maple, sweet pepper bush, cinnamon fern, and silky dogwood. We then had wetland two, um, which is to the northeast of the site, um, which is a small fringe palestrian forested wetland adjacent to Maple Meadow Brook. Dominant vegetation there included red maple, high bush blueberry, and sweet pepper bush. Um, we then, of course, um, have the 100 year floodplain, which is indicated um, by purple, which is the bordering land subject to flooding. Um, which kind of just skirts around the, the project site because these bunkers are raised. We're not really in um, bordering land subject to flooding, so no impacts there. And then as Brittany mentioned, we have impacts within the 200 foot riverfront and then the 100 foot um, buffer to bordering vegetated wetlands, which are indicated by the blue, the thin blue and, and green lines. Um, so with that, we are going to ask that the Commission find this project's minor nature and um, hopefully issue a negative determination of applicability. Does anyone have any questions for Brittany or I? Can I, Dawn, Dawn, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, what's the purpose of these storage? Are, are you, st is the company storing anything hazardous materials or radioactive or anything dangerous or is it just um, obsolete equipment? 
Um, I guess I'll, I'll defer to um, either Alec White or, or Jeremy Howell um, on, on what, what is actually stored in those storage areas or, or what we can say publicly. Jeremy, do you want to answer um, from a very high level? Uh, th that's um, material that's stored for the support of their uh, government contract programs uh, in that area limits are stored away from the occupied spaces that they're built. Somehow to me that was broken up. I, I didn't understand what you said. Mm -hmm. I apologize. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> I apologize. That that storage facility uh, is is maintained for materials that are used for uh, in, in support of their government contracts and program uh, programs that they uh, they run, so it uh, it varies, um, and I don't know the specifics of exactly what they um, they house in there. And uh, maybe Jeremy, you can speak to that a little bit, um, give them some background. I think that's something that we really would like to know. So the, the government programs that we are running uh, are, are, um, have some energetics that we use to, to build the products. And the energetics that we have are stored in these bunkers. So as far as the determination of what exactly and how, what levels, I, I don't have the exacts. They're, they're energetics. I guess just to clarify, those are existing bunkers that have been there um, with the same use since the 50s. And, and really the project that we're proposing is a, a maintenance project just to repair um, existing HVAC. Uh, what we're proposing will not change or alter the, the existing use in that location. Yeah, but see, this just come up now that we're doing this. And I think at this time, we didn't know what was in there and we should know what's going in there or what's in there. I think that's important. We'll put that off right now, but I, th I think that has to be uh, answered. Well, being, I, being that these uh, are uh, government programs, I, I, the only thing I can let you know is that they are energetics. I mean, that's, that's to the level I can give you. Sorry, what are energetics? Uh, rocket motors, small rocket motors, um, some to, uh, to that, those lines, nothing more than that. All motors? Yes. But nothing that could leach into the waterways during construction? Abs absolutely not. The floor is actually raised above. So there's no, they're, they're actually empty right now for construction. So, so was that facility um, approved by DEP or EPA or someone back in 1950 when it was constructed? Absolutely, yes. So that hasn't changed, is that what you're saying? That's correct, that's correct. I would suspect, although I don't know who, but I would, I would suspect that some other governing body has, uh, would approve of what you can store in there. Absolutely, the uh, the ATF is involved with that, so they they're very well aware of what we have, and they give approvals for that. Who who is that, Jeremy? The ATF is involved with what we store in there for energetics. So, they, to be they, clear, this has been reviewed and discussed with the, the state yeah. fire marshal, and these improvements are um, in line with their orders. Yeah, what, that, what, that, that's what I would, is that correct? Excuse me. The ductwork carries only air. Is that that's it? Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> the, the existing HVAC system serving those uh, those bunkers uh, had been inactive for a period of time, and it's it's uh, important to maintain uh, both airflow and humidity level in those uh, storage facilities. So, as part of the um, request from the fire marshal uh, is to bring that existing system back online. So uh, the maintenance of that system is our, our primary goal. If, okay. if the ductwork rotted out, uh, was it in the water table? No, um, 
Hi, this is Cindy Murphy from Margulies Prudzi Architects. The ductwork runs underneath, um, it starts at the that, uh, mechanical building and runs underneath the ground and then up the hill um, over the tops of the storage units. Um, we put a scope in there at the beginning of the project and saw that um, where the ductwork turned upward um, to go up over the storage units, that's where we noticed decay and at that point our camera couldn't progress any further to go um, and scope the limits as it went over the, the storage units. It was damaged from the top falling into the ductwork. There was no damage from the bottom of the ductwork into the ground that we noted. So the existing ductwork is on top of the units under that soil layer? Correct, yes. The ductwork okay. runs with a minimum of two feet of soil on top of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Cameron, Valerie, do you have any comments from your points of view? We have no additional comments. Um, okay, any more questions, Vinny? No, no, no. Uh, Laura? No questions. Ron? I'm okay. Tom? You're muted. No, I'm all set, Ryan. Okay, Mike. Uh, two questions. Um, does the is the applicant address what type of equipment, how they're going to get to do this work, and what impact that'll have on the uh, the two areas in question? And secondly, uh, I'd like to back what Laura said earlier. I, I typically with any applicant, we want to know what's stored in there, or at least some indication that it, if it's leached out, that it wouldn't uh, impact the resource areas. And I don't think we got a satisfactory answer for that. Um, I don't know, Alex, do you want me to answer at least the first question? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, for the first part of Mike's question, I think, which was about the HVAC equipment. Yeah, so the work in the building is, is easy to access. Um, we would use standard um, construction equipment to bring in the air handler unit and do the work <laughs> that's outside of that area. As soon as we do work on the ground over the bunker storage areas, we would be doing that with hand shovels to uh, minimize disturbance. Um, it's fairly soft soil up there, so we would do it in slow methods, not using any machinery to move the soil. Um, I think the second part, Jeremy can answer a little bit more, but I can tell you from an architect's perspective, um, I also don't have full knowledge of what is stored in those, but for the questions that I asked to make sure I understood what I was designing around, there are no liquids stored in there. Um, so the materials stored are in a stable condition. Um, they're not something that would seep into the soil, um, nor something that could leak through a um, container or anything like that. Correct. And they are within a concrete vault, both on the bottom and the sides. Um, so it's not like there's soil underneath them. It, it's a, a full concrete walls on, on bottom, top, and sides. And there is curbing inside the, the vaults to, to allow, you know, keep everything inside the vaults. And there's no liquid products whatsoever in these vaults, so. Okay, Mike? I guess if the commission is satisfied with that response, I. I'm just, um, it seems like we're getting some fuzzy answers on uh, what exactly the material is, but uh, my only concern isn't what the material is, is just that it wouldn't leak. Well, what I guess I am concerned what it is, but if anything leached out, which they're indicating it won't, but uh, things do, um, would it harm the environment? And um, I don't know if we have a uh, satisf satisfactory answer to that, but we'll let the commission vote on it. Well, I guess a question we could we could ask is uh, if the storage facility were repurposed and you decided uh, instead of uh, mechanical or electrical equipment to store chemi chemicals in there, uh, who to whom would you have to go for approval and would you have to notify the town <clears throat> that change has been made? I think from an architectural perspective, if chemicals were to be stored in that, it would change the use um, classification of the storage facility. 
and therefore we would have to go to the building department and apply for a change of use permit. Okay, so the town would be looped into uh, that change of use. Correct, yep. Okay. Benny, did you have a question? Um, do we have any soil testings of the area at this time or do we need any? I guess I, I'm not aware of any uh, recent geotechnical explorations, um, whether they be environmental. I, I don't know if Alec or, or Jeremy are aware of any that have been done recently. Uh, not to my knowledge. Yeah, not, not to my either. There's nothing that I can say that has been done. Vinny, were you think of, uh, thinking I, of I, a, ba I think a baseline? Of, I, I think the second part of my question was, do, do we, we need any uh, soil testing at this time uh, to see just what uh, is in the area and so we can monitor it at a later date? Well, I can tell you that the, the waters around the area are constantly monitored, monitored by outside sources for, for anything that, you know, any contaminants that may get in there from parking lots or whatnot. So, I mean, we can show you those reports. But. Okay, if, if we can have those reports, I think that would be, that would be uh, fine. That's great. Okay. I, I think any questions I might have had got picked up along the way. Um, are there any questions from the audience? From the public? Any hands raised? No hands raised. Sort of, okay. Um, so I'll... Uh, I'll ask for a motion to issue a negative three. Is, I think it's is it actually, I think it's actually a two. Um, they are within the resource area, um, so it would be a, a two. Okay. Can we condition that on receipt of the uh, water reports? I, I'm concerned that there's something stored there that they can't tell us quite what, but the fire marshal is concerned. And I, I, I just like to make sure that loop's closed. With this type of um, determination um, with a negative two, I don't know that you, you can condition it, um, but we can ask them for those reports. Um, well, I guess right. we could either withhold the uh, determination till next meeting and we've received the reports or if you tell me that we can revoke uh, the determination if we don't receive the reports then I'm comfortable. Don can I chime in? Um, yes. And my experience working as an environmental engineer on similar facilities generally these facilities are carefully designed to make sure nothing leaches or is and it can all be contained within the facility that is happening. So I think the what is stored there is not entirely relevant to the determination. Um, especially it sounds like they're being very proactive in monitoring the surface water um, in, the, in the area to make sure that nothing is impacted even by the parking lots as Jeremy said. Um, but yeah, I don't personally in my experience or yeah, I've worked on several facilities similar to this in my experience, and I don't see a connection to the contents of the bunker versus, you know, the work. It's it sounds like routine maintenance work, um, and something that wouldn't be impacted by what's stored in the bunker. Thank you. Um, so let me say this: I I think that maybe as a courtesy, if you could supply the commission with a water monitoring report, a recent one for the files. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, we can just sort of go ahead and say, okay, we know where we are today, yeah. January, 2021. And if there's a big change, then it would be interesting. 
Because uh, I, I, I do, I, I agree with um, Laura. I think we might be getting a little out of our, out of our depth in terms of uh, what we need to know in, in order to approve this. Um, so I think that we can sort of uh, cover ourselves a bit if you're willing to provide the report. Um, and then we'll just, you know, move on and approve the project. Everyone okay with that? I'm okay with it. I, no. I, I... All right. So um, could I have a motion for uh, a negative two determination for 201 Lowell Street, the coverage storage upgrades? So moved. Thank you, Laura. And a second? Okay, I'll, I'll second it. Go ahead. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, for the vote, uh, Vinny? I'm okay with it. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? No. Don? Yes. Thank you all very much for your time this evening. You're welcome. Good night now. Good night. Thank you all. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is a continued public hearing for an ANRAD for six Tobin Drive. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think you skipped over a couple new ones at seven. Oh, we did. You're right. I apologize. Um, the next item is a notice of intent for 12 Clorinda Road. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Luke Roy, LJR Engineering, on behalf of the applicant. I'll just yep. share my screen here to get the plan up. Uh, so this is a notice of intent that we've submitted uh, for... I'm having trouble with my screen here. Uh, notice of intent for 12 Clorinda Road. It's a, for a proposed addition uh, to an existing single family dwelling. Um, we've identified uh, wetland resource areas impacting the site, um, basically associated with an intermittent stream uh, that flows uh, across the rear of the property. Uh, there's a portion of the delineated resource area that was just the bank of that intermittent stream. And then towards the rear, there was a bordering vegetated wetland um, section that was uh, separately delineated. Um, so the essentially the project is what their propo applicants proposing as a 17 by 20 addition to the rear of the existing dwelling. Um, it's going essentially in an area that's at currently a deck, um, which is proposed to be removed. So the area where the addition is, is um, currently deck. Uh, so essentially squaring off the back of the house there. Um, so the, the corner of the addition will be 32 feet from the wetlands at the closest point. Uh, beyond the 25 foot no build buffer from the BVW line. Um, we're proposing a uh, subsurface uh, roof drain infiltration system uh, to capture and infiltrate the runoff from the uh, proposed addition that's located right here to the rear. Uh, and we've encompassed the um, work area and with erosion control, um, the septic system is located on uh, the northerly side of the house, so there's no impact uh, to that as far as setbacks go. Um, and there's really no other grading um, proposed, essentially to remain the same. Just basically a landing and stairway from the the addition down to an existing patio area uh, to remain. Um, well, that's basically uh, the project. Um, 
and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Uh, Valerie or Cameron? Uh, sure, sure, I'll take this one. Uh, we didn't have any comments about uh, the addition itself. There's um, roof infiltration proposed for it. Uh, the wetland itself is pretty easy to, um, to see. There's a, a slope, uh, a bank running along the side, like Luke said. And then in the rear, there's a slope that goes down from the yard area behind that shed. Um, so it's, it's pretty clear to see. Um, we, we do have to note there's a, an above ground pool and a shed in the 15 foot no disturbed buffer. Those didn't receive um, that we could find anyway, any um, prior approvals, uh, but they have been there for quite some time. The pool over 30 years and the shed um, being um, over 10 years. Um, so those things, you know, have been there for quite some time. The shed have a, um, a concrete pad as a, a foundation, so it wouldn't be something that you would probably want moved. Um, we, um, Cameron had spoken to the homeowner. She indicated that the pool um, is old and, and she had plans to remove it. Um, so just wanted to kind of talk about how when those structures are removed, um, you know, the expectation would be that they would be replaced um, with structures that would better meet those, those setbacks that you like to see. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, did, you get the, uh, did you get the impression that the pool and the shed would be removed at the same time? Are they? No, um, when, I, when I spoke to the homeowner, uh, she said that they don't really use the pool anymore and um, she didn't give obvious, she didn't give me a specific date but she said that maybe in the next few years they would they would remove the the pool um, but nothing no mention of the shed and it, I, I don't think the shed um, would necessarily be an easy thing to remove either because there is a slab and it ultimately might cause more damage um, taking it out than leaving it as is. Yep. Okay, thanks. Uh, members of the commission, Vinny? No questions. Uh, Mike? I'm sent. Uh, Laura? No questions. Ron? I'm good. Tom? No questions. Okay. Uh, I don't have any questions either. So um, are there any comments or questions from the public on this one, Valerie? Well, let's see. If anyone has any comments or questions, if you could raise your, your hand or indicate that you have a question or comment. Questions or comments. OK. Uh, could I have a motion then to close the hearing for uh, 12 Clarinda Roads Notice of Intent, please? Yeah, so moved, yeah. Thank you, Vinny. Uh, second. A second from Mike, was it? Yep. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for the vote, Vinny? Okay, yeah. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. And myself, Don, yes. Uh, do we have an order, a draft order? For we this? do. We have a draft order. Um, we didn't get a chance to send it to Luke to review, um, but I can pull it up on the screen and we can go over it. Um, <coughs> we, included, we included all of our typical standard conditions um, because there weren't any wasn't anything special to, to note. Um, so I, I can read through the whole thing or we can kind of skip to the end where we did have some questions for the commission. Um, I think Luke has seen a bunch of these. So with your, with your approval, Luke, do you want to go to the end where the questions are? Yes, certainly. Okay. okay. So the only question we had, um, typically uh, we, 
we require, we sometimes require um, demarcation. We don't always require demarcation on additions, um, but that was sort of the, um, the question we had. Do you want to require any sort of demarcation um, on the property um, or, you know, leave it as is? There is a, an existing fence that runs um, kind of behind the pool um, and along the back of the shed that does um, cut off the yard area from the wetland area. Um, again, it's not in a location that, that would you would prefer, but it, it, it sort of demarcates that edge of yard and beginning of slope down to the end. So if that's something that's um, fine as is, um, then you know, there wouldn't need to be demarcation along that, that side of things. There isn't any fence on the back side along the property line, um, but it does kind of pull back from the wetland in that location. So um, in this case, I don't know that you, you need to require demarcation, um, but we wanted to bring it up as a discussion point. Uh, Valerie, if they were to remove the pool at some point, they would, um come before the commission to to uh, do the removal, right? Yeah, we would see that demo permit and that would trigger a review by you guys for sure. So that would, ha that would uh, kick off another chance to put in some kind of demarcation. Yeah, Absolute and pool. right, and, and potentially in a, in a more appropriate location too. Okay, uh, you said that there was no fence at some point, wouldn't the yard have to be enclosed with the pool or? The pool is enclosed, um, but the, the fence um, doesn't go uh, to the rear, all the way across the rear property line. It stops. Where, where the well is? Um, it, uh, stops, it stops just beyond the shed. Um, yeah. I can pull up the, the plan again, if that's helpful. Um, yeah, I think the fence doesn't continue to the left side of the shed. Yeah, it, there's, as Valerie I, said, the wetland kind of peels away at that point. Yeah, there's, there's one. A, there's, yeah. There's one or so panels of fence right here on this side of the shed. Uh, but then, as you can see, the property line goes across like this. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so there's, yeah. there's no fence back here. We're not seeing anything. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Let me just. Uh, we can see your imagination. That's it. <laughs> that better? Can you see the plan? Yes. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. So here's the shed in the back. Um, there's a panel of fence on this side, and then it stops sort of at the property line right here. So there's no fence that runs in the back here. Um, it runs all along this other side over here, um, but it, it does not run across here. That said, we didn't see any um, dumping or even yard waste back there, which was great and impressive. Um, so, you know, we didn't, we didn't know if you needed to require demarcation along this edge, um, since it is existing yard space. And, um, and eventually when, you know, these types of structures would be replaced or removed, um, you would be looking at maybe um, pulling that demarcation closer to the 15 it's um, currently. Okay, good, thanks. Um, now, where did that come in? Was that, we were, we were, were we at the point of? So we were looking at the draft. Oh, looking at the draft order, yeah. Let me pull it back up. Yeah. And Is, we had highlighted that demarcation condition, we can take that out um, at this point um, if it's not appropriate. Could we, in lieu of that, uh, request that they maintain the existing fence? Um, well, here's the, here's the kind of complication with that. The, the existing fence is, is close to the wetland. Um, and it kind of has to be because it has to run around the back of the, back of the pool. And um, in the future, you're going to probably want a fence 
a different kind of fence. You're not going to want, um, well, it's going to be a question for you to consider in the future when that pool goes away, I guess, uh, where, where is the appropriate location for a fence. Um, well, that's a separate issue, but for now, you could request at least that existing fence be maintained because if you don't, if you don't require de demarcation, then there's nothing stopping them from taking that fence down. I think we would see that as a positive actually, taking down the fence because it's so close to the wetland. Um, so I guess there, that's another kind of discussion item. It's, it's right on the, the slope that goes down to the wetland. You don't have any sort of vegetated buffer um, before you get to that fence. It's right there on that that edge. So it's not a it's not a great demarcation fence. It's a, a fence that certainly separates the yard from the wetland, um, but it doesn't provide what you would typically want as a vegetated kind of buffer, the 15 foot no disturbed buffer. Well, I was just trying to make a distinction between what's going to happen now and who knows when that pool will come down and then it gets addressed in that regard with the proper demarcation at that time. So trying to make the distinction that it, from a temporal standpoint, but if nobody else thinks it's necessary, I, I would go along with that too. I just thought it would be a, in lieu of requiring demarcation, just keep the fence where it is for now and address it later when the pool and shed come down. If the pool um, is not being used at all and they're going to take it down, why don't we condition they take down the pool and erect the fence? Well, that's really not something that they applied to do. So I'm not sure that they're interested in spending the money. It's, it's sort of, uh, that's their territory, I would think. Uh, I, what Mike, uh, tell me if this is what you suggested, Mike. Uh, you, you suggested putting in some sort of demarcation at the place where we would normally require it in place of the fence that is currently to the right of the pool? Well, not exactly. I was thinking along the lines of there's an existing fence, which is between the shed and the pool and beyond that could stay uh, for now. That's, that's what their intention would be. But my concern was that once you give the auto condition without any demarcation in there, now you take now they can go and take the fence down, and there's no physical barrier between the uh, resource area. You would have to keep that fence up as long as they have the the pool, though, right? So they they have the the fence encloses the the pool area. Um, so I think they'd have to have that fence if they have a pool. So once that pool comes down, um, triggers review by the commission, um, then that fence, you know, kind of becomes a topic of conversation. Because right now, if, if you were to, um, you know, you, you can't put a, a fence, you can't pull a fence back from the wetland because of that pool. I'd, I'd be tempted to sort of keep it simple and wait until the until the pool comes down. That's that's my own point of view. Uh, let's let's get some other opinions. How do you how do you feel about that, Vinny? Uh, I, I I don't know. I, I'm looking at the plan. I'm, the plan. I, I see the pool, but I don't see any fence around the size of the pool in the front of the pool. So it's really not. I don't know. I don't We're know. talking about the one in the back, right? Yeah, the, the, the back, and right now it has to stay there. Yeah. As long as the pool's there. Yeah. Is is a fence required with an above ground pool? If you have a fence on the pool. Oh, it's above the ground. Yeah, so it's above the ground. It has. Uh, there was probably a platform and whatnot. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I guess it depends on how how yeah. you get up to it, right? Um, they have a deck there. 
we we didn't take pictures. We didn't um, look in detail at the pool. Um, well, we don't need to belabor the point, but the point I was trying to make is the fence is not necessarily required because of the pool. Um, and whether you take it down or not, that's another decision somebody can comment on. I was just trying to say, keep it up with some sort of delineation for the interim, but it doesn't have to be a big deal. I, I can go either way. We can go without that and just approve this and move on. All right, Laura, how do you feel? Leave, leave, leave the, leave the fen, leave the demarcation until we talk about the pool at some later date. Yeah, yeah. I want to say like it sounds like the fence won't be moved until they do anything with the pool. And since we're not looking at anything in the yard, we're just looking at an addition on an existing deck. They're not likely to be doing anything with the fence. Okay, thanks, Ron. How about you? I'm okay with what they've proposed. Tom? Yes, I think the proposal is okay as is. Okay. So back to the order. Um, I guess we'll remove the one that talks about demarcation. Sure. Is that right? And then there was one that you highlighted at the very last condition. Yes, yeah, so um, that's our, our typical condition about um, setbacks, which um, these structures do not meet um, the existing pool and shed did not meet the, the setback. So um, so this, this condition is also kind of problematic. Yeah. So and as such, you just remove it? That's what we would do, yeah. OK. Yep. All I'm, right. Yes, Laura? For that, for that last one, um, can we change the language to say something like no additional disturbance? So like we acknowledge that there are things within the setbacks, but not to do anything else. Yeah, we've done that before, haven't we, Valerie? No new structure, no... No new disturbance. No new disturbance. Yeah, I think that's okay with me. Okay, we could say no new structure and no new disturbance. We can say that. You're like no additional structures and no new disturbance. Yep. Okay. Luke, are sounds you? That sounds reasonable. Okay, good. So why don't we move ahead with a, with a vote on the, on a, to issue the order of conditions. Okay. Are we, did we cover all the, the outstanding items, Valerie? I believe we did. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion to issue the order of conditions for 12 Clarinda Road, please? So moved. Uh, Ron, thank you. Second, please. Second. Uh, second from Vinny, was it? Yep. Yep, thank you. Uh, to the vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. Don? Yes. Great. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks, Thank sir. you. Have a good night. Yeah, I know. Okay, the, the next um, item is uh, a notice of intent for 687 Main Street. Yeah, hi, Mr. Chairman. It's Attorney John McKenna for the applicant for 687 Main Street. Um, if you remember, Mr. Chairman, this is a U-Haul uh, property, and uh, we had a notice of intent uh, that was denied in, uh, in order to come back with a new notice of intent, which we filed. Yep. That's what we're here on behalf uh, with the filing today. Uh, the intent was filed. Uh, we have comments from the engineers that came in today, and, and Valerie had sent over some comments. And yep. We're going to review them and set up a meeting with Valerie and the engineer oh. next, meet, next week to go over them. Uh, we'll also uh, have the filing for the site plan and the stormwater management plan, uh, which will be filed tomorrow. So what we'd like to do this evening is to request a continuance and um, 
for the next meeting in February. Mm -hmm. That way we can have a meeting with uh, the engineer to go over his comments and try to pull it together. It's a new design with infiltration in the back, uh, different from the, from the prior design, which we hope is a little bit more robust. We need to talk a little bit more about the riverfront um, and maybe cutting back a little towards the, the brook side as uh, Valerie had indicated to me today. So um, I'll turn it over to Valerie to put her input in, but uh, that's what I think we're, we're looking to do tonight, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yeah, and I think it would give the commissioners a chance to have any uh, um, any questions sort of put on the record as well, right? Yeah, we're looking to get this matter. Uh, this is really more of an enforcement order where they did the work uh, unintentionally without a permit. They didn't know they needed a permit through the public works. The public works, you know, only yep. does it for roadways. But clearly with the proximity to the riverfront area of the brook, uh, it should come before the conservation so, so we're looking to get this thing done right so i'll, I'll turn it over to valerie for him, her input on that thank you valerie okay uh, valerie sure um we did have some comments you'll see them in the um the packet um, we, we just need them to do a little bit more analysis um give us a little bit more robust um information um the town engineer provided comments on the stormwater design um and Again, they would just need to provide some more information, um, make some tweaks to that. Um, I told Attorney McKenna that uh, we'd set up a meeting for next week to go over those comments so that we can um, make some progress on this project. Okay. Um, do you have a way of putting the existing conditions up on the screen? I had a question. Sure. Let me yeah. pull those up. So we can go around the commission now while that's taking place. Uh, did you have any um, questions or comments on the new material, Vinny? Yeah. Um, how about you, Laura? No. Um, Ron? Uh, no, I'm, I'm waiting for their response to the engineering comments. Uh, Tom? Uh, no questions yet. Uh, Mike? Nope, all set. Okay. Yeah, I had a question uh, about the uh, paved area, the newly paved area. There, there's a dotted line that shows the pavement seam, sort of that unusual shape that looks a little like Texas that got run over down towards the building. See the, this, the dotted line where it says pavement seam? Right here. Yeah. I think that's where the prior pavement was, Mr. Chairman, and then they went from there back. So, so the new. I'll have to find out, or that could be a delineation of. That could be a delineation of. If you can zoom it out, there's a little. There's highlights that could be like a. An elevation, maybe. I can't That's sort see of what it. I was wondering is what was you know where did the the new pavement get? Well, it's a setback line, pavement seam there, and then the other the top bottom part of the part that looks like Texas is a setback. Yeah, so, so yeah, did, this is the 82 contour right here. So that's the see the 82 that contour wraps around this way. And then the okay. dotted line is where it's where the pavement seam is, which is a little bit more of a regular line. Okay, good. And so the new pavement is from there up in the, this in way. The, yes. Okay, good. Right. Um, that was one question I had. Another, there, there was some, uh, in, the, in the alternatives analysis that was provided, um, since we're looking at an after the fact filing, the, the alternatives are sort of what you have in front of you now, 
versus what you used to have. And what might be missing is what you could have done if you had come to the commission and uh, asked to pave part of that graveled area. So, um, you know, I, I sort of looked at the alternatives as being maybe incomplete in that sense. Okay, I understand your point there, Mr. Chairman. You see what I mean? Like yeah. I would have said, for example, you, you, you know, one alternative would have been not to pave so close to the brook, right? Uh, but to pave, you know, you know, down the midline, you know, or, or something to that extent and put in more, uh, you know, put in more trees and shrubs along the brook. Yeah, and I think that's an alternative that Valerie had discussed with me today to move it a little further away from the brook. So I, I, I understand that point. Okay, good. Is that correct, Valerie? I mean, we talked about that earlier today, I think. Yeah, um, Mr. Chairman, I had, had talked to Attorney McKenna and suggested that, you know, really the pavement is quite close to the brook. And um, if that can be moved back and more area restored along that edge, um, it's unclear what the condition was before the pavement. I have big collections of it. Um, and so it's hard to... Um, it's hard to know what was previously altered and what was not. Um, and because of that, um, that, I think that's the, the trouble here. It's, it's hard to, um, usually you're supposed to have a hundred foot of vegetation in the riverfront, um, yeah. disturbed vegetation. Here we don't have that. And we don't know exactly what was vegetation and what wasn't. Um, so I think if they can you know, provide some more restoration where it matters most along the brook and um, make the stormwater work. Um, they'll be getting to a place where, you know, it's approvable by the commission. Okay, good. Um, yeah. Because I was sort of thinking of it from the point of view, if you'd come in with the, the project and said, we'd like to do this, you might have gotten that kind of input. I, I, yeah. Good. All right. So, there's going to be meetings and you're going to respond to the T engineers comments and we meet again in February, right? Correct. All right. Uh, any, any other questions or comments from the commission? Okay. If not, um, how about the audience? I guess we, we need to bring them in. Any public questions or comments? <clears throat> If you do have a comment or a question, please raise your hand or just indicate that you have a question. No questions, no comments. Okay. Uh, could I have a motion to continue the um, hearing for 687 Main Street until the February, I don't have my calendar. Wait. Third. February. February 3rd. February 3rd meeting. So moved. All right, I'm gonna to have to. All right. Uh, who made the uh, the motion? Mike. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and the second, please. Second. Vinny seconded. Thank you, Vinny. Um, to the vote, then, Vinny. Okay. Laura. Yes. Ron. Yes. Tom. Yes. Mike. Mike, you, uh, how do you vote on the yes. <clears throat> continuance? Good. And Don, yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. See you next month. Yep. Thank you, Valerie. I'll talk to you on Monday. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Boom. Okay. Now the next item on the agenda is the continued public hearing for the ANRAD for 6 Tobin Drive. And, go ahead. <laughs> we, re Mr. Chairman, we received a request to continue the hearing. Um, the, um, the applicant was um, 
he was out of commission for a little while, and now he has indicated that he is going to go ahead with peer review, and um, we're going to get that going. Um, so they requested to continue to the February meeting. Okay. Um, could I have a motion to continue the ANRAD for 6 Tobin Drive to the February 3rd commission hearing, please? Second. Laura? Laura made the motion. Vinny seconded the motion. Vinny, how do you vote? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. Don? Yes. <clears throat> uh, the next item on the agenda is a continued public hearing for a notice of, of intent for Shady Lane Drive. Yes, and Mr. Chairman, we received a request to continue to the February meeting. Okay. Could I have a motion to continue the continued public hearing for the notice of intent for Shady Lane Drive to the February 3rd commission meeting? So moved. Ron, second. thank you. Vinny, thank you for the second. Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. And Don, yes. It's getting easier and easier. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a continued public hearing for the notice of intent for 378, 384 Middlesex Ave and 200 Jefferson Road. Yes, and Mr. Chairman, um, if you remember at the last hearing, um, uh, we talked about a peer review and getting a peer reviewer to take a look at the materials um, and that it would be sort of tight timing to get that report back to you guys. Uh, we did get a, a peer reviewer, Ellie, <clears throat> we've done work with um, for the commission before. LEC did do the field work. Um, they've done that and they're getting a report together. Um, today I heard back from them, they're going to be submitting that by um, next Tuesday. And um, so we don't have that peer, peer review report quite yet. Um, so we were hoping to schedule a special meeting before February to move the project along, but um, with our council's schedule and LEC's schedule, um, it just doesn't seem like it's, it's able to happen. So um, the applicant, um, let me know today, this afternoon, that they're agreeable to go to the February 3rd meeting and we will get the peer review report out to you guys as soon as we get it so you can start reviewing it. Okay, thank you. Um, so may I have a motion to continue the continued public hearing for the notice of intent for 380, 378, 384 Middlesex Ave and Jefferson Road to the February 3rd commission hearing. So moved. Vinny, thank you for the motion. A second, please. Second. Thank you, Ron. Seconded it. Um, how do you vote, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? Yes. Mike? Yes. Don? Yes. <clears throat> OK. Um, Don, before we leave this completely, could I just sure. request that if there is a significant uh, difference between the peer review and what's been proposed, that maybe we schedule a, a, a site visit before the uh, the next meeting so we, we can take a look at the differences? Weather permitting. Yeah. Yes. So oh, why, don't, um, why don't we get the peer review report out to you guys? You can take a look. Um, we'll get it to you right away. We won't wait to, for a pack or anything. We'll get it to you right away. You can take a look and see if you'd like to do a, a site visit or not and just let us know and we'll, um, we'll set something up. Great. Okay, good. Thanks, Valerie. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a request for a certificate of compliance for 27 Green Meadow Drive. So I went out to the property and um, I didn't see anything concerning it. Uh, it looked it looked like he has built, so it looks good. Okay. Um, 
Could I have a motion that we issue a certificate of compliance for 27 Green Meadow Drive? So moved. Vinny, thank you. A second, please. Second. Ron seconded the motion. Thanks, Ron. Uh, to the vote then, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Tom? By the time you're muted. Yes. Thank you. Mike? Yes. And Don, yes. Um, the tree, tree approvals are really just for our information, correct? That's correct. So I would ask if anyone has, any of the commissioners have a question uh, or comments on the 18 Patches Pond Lane administrative tree removal. Hearing none, how about the 25 Marjorie Road tree removal? Nope. Nope, okay. Very good. Um, so it seems like this tree removal thing is actually a plus. That's what took two things off the agenda. And it's, it's sort of taken one or two off of agendas in the past, which is nice. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of um, dead or, you know, almost dead trees that are able to be taken down uh, without coming to you guys, which I think people really appreciate. Yeah, yeah, good. Um, okay, the, we have the remote participation policy. I think we, we had some discussion about it in December, and it looks like you got the feedback into the uh, to Jeff and the selectmen uh, is is anything else sort of so that desired of us that memo is a draft memo that I that I drafted um, for you for the planning board and for the open space committee to review to see if I've captured your your sentiments um, correctly mm -hmm. uh, I haven't submitted that yet I'll submit that oh, okay. tomorrow um, it's a draft for review. I'll submit that tomorrow uh, to the, the town manager, um, but I wanted to kind of try to capture what you guys were talking about. And um, if you have any thoughts, questions, comments, um, I can incorporate those into the draft for submittal. Yeah, if I remember correctly, it was Mike, Mike where you were bringing up the, the <laughs> potential technological difficulties of having remote participation with lots of multimedia, was that? Did... Yeah, that's correct, yeah. I just, I've seen it happen, so I'm just forewarning people that that's likely to be a, an issue. Yeah, did, did the uh, memo that Valerie's got uh, drafted sort of capture your, your concern? Um, I hate to admit that I haven't read it. <laughs> you wanna bring it up, Valerie? Can you? I can, sure. Okay, thanks. Just give me one second here. Okay. Just have to check that. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't know if you want me to read through it. Um, the first kind of chunk of it is just talking about how, and Mike, the, the planning board members agreed with you, it's going to be very difficult for the, the person who's remote to be able to get a, a full understanding of what's being discussed and to actually be able to see a presentation. Um, you know, I kind of explained that, that you know, there's presentations and visuals that are presented with a board. Um, so, you know, unless there's a camera person who's, who's sort of uh, moving around and capturing the presentation and the discussion amongst the committee members, it'll be really hard for that person to have a full understanding of what's happening. Um, so I tried to capture that um, in that blurb and then some additional comments that came up. Um, just some clarifications. Um, Ron actually gave me some some comments about, um, you know, that are there if if uh, 
if a, um, an applicant wants to continue their hearing because not everyone's going to be in person, um, they should be able to kind of decide that. Um, and then I kind of take that a step further. Are there any complications legally if, if um, someone's not in the room for uh, a vote and it's appealed? Um, mm -hmm. So um, just some, some suggestions, yeah. clarification for, for pieces of it and um, that it may be difficult for certain, certain boards and committees when they rely on visuals. It looks fine to me. So if, if anyone has any any edits or comments, just let me know um, sometime tomorrow. It's actually due tomorrow. So uh, maybe tomorrow morning, if you have uh, any comments for me, just uh, send them over. Great. All right, we'll do that. Okay. Uh, so um, we have minutes, but but you also sl slipped in a an appeal from the DEP for uh, one of the projects that we um... actually, before we even get to that, yeah. I have um, one more item on the revised agenda. Um, um, there are some some gentlemen who um, would like to take on a project to install bat houses um, in a couple places in town. So they're here tonight and want to just give a quick oh, good. Um, presentation of what they're proposing, if that's okay. That was perfect. Hi. Okay, great. Hey, everyone. Hello. Thank you for having me and uh, my project partner, Sam, here. Hi, Sam. Um, so yeah, we're both seniors at Wilmington High School. Uh, we partake in the service learning class where we learn about just general service to the community. And the big overarching theme of the class um, is the uh, service projects. And that's varied for each different person, but generally people like to raise money for what they believe is a good cause. And for us, we both care about obviously the climate and conservation and obviously protecting the local animal population, which is what this particular project is about. Um, bats have a very negative stigma attached to them, obviously given the recent uh, pandemic, there's, yeah. A lot of stuff surrounding that. And um, if you're not aware, a bat house is basically just a bird house, but you know, as the name suggests, it hosts bats instead of um, birds. Um, so we would like to install around six of these bird house, bat houses, my bad, um, on the conservation lands. Uh, two of them in the conservation lands near the Hathaway Acres neighborhood, uh, two in the Wilmington Town Forest, and two uh, behind the medical center, which is across from uh, the Hathaway Acres neighborhood. And uh, I, I constructed these bad houses, six of them with um, rough zone thick boards from Home Depot, um, weather resistant uh, screws and glue to hold them together. Um, and they're um, put up about 10 to 15 feet high on, in the trees um, with, with two weather resistant screws. Um, and with, uh, with research, bat houses actually limit human interaction with bats. So the people who do live near these neighborhoods will see less bats than they normally do. And in the summers, um, hopefully reduce mosquito population near them, which is another positive. Sam, do you by any chance have a bat house next to you you could hold up? Um, we have a picture. We can uh, share yeah. the screen if you'd like. Uh, yeah. If do I have permission to share my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Please do. So um, they're about uh, two feet high, uh, one foot wide. Um, there's they're single chamber bat houses. Yep. Here it is. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, nice. single chamber bat houses. Um, and inside there's a um, window screen, at, which acts as um, a surface for the bats to cling onto and roost inside. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, pictures from Google Earth, which are overheads of um, rough estimates of the locations where these houses would be, if people would like to see them. Yeah, bring it on. Okay. Uh, here's the medical center location. Um, they're sort of about 
20 feet or so, maybe 30 feet across um, off of the path that runs behind there. Um, yeah. This is the Hathaway Acres location. As you can see, it's like very far off from the um, street itself, Draper Drive, I believe it's called. Um, mm -hmm. And it's near local wetlands, which is obviously uh, where mosquitoes tend to be located. So it's a great food source for the bats. And here's the uh, Wilmington Town Forest location. Uh, it's near the um, water tower that it's located up there because it needs to be a somewhat open area for the bats to be able to fly out. And yeah. Is, is there a way that you plan to see if anyone's home after they've been up there for a while? Uh, we'd like to check in every so often. We don't have exact dates, um, but we hope by the end of this year, there should be population sustained inside of them. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Could you could you send a note to us or something like that when you yeah. when you've uh, gotten an answer one way or the other? Of course. Good. Vinny, yes. Uh, are you planning to build uh, uh, to build some extras to sell them? Uh, no, we're not planning to build uh, extras <laughs> to sell. <laughs> <laughs> Although um, my our business teacher asked if um, she could pay for materials and if I could make one for her because she was she's been interested in bad houses she said yeah we're available <laughs> <laughs> yeah what I mean if you had the plans or something like that you know <coughs> how, how how do you plan to get the bats to go in the houses to start out with. Um, so bats naturally roost in uh, dead trees and other areas in people's um, like attics, barns, things like that. So they are um, already uh, very used to finding homes in hard areas. So once, once they uh, do find this, then the other bats will follow and hopefully um, we'll provide them a safe place to live. So how many bats in a bat house and are they both bat men and bat women? <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> we hope there's no uh, superheroes running around the town, but uh, yeah, I believe a typical bat population inside one of these things. I don't have it pulled up right now. Oh, yeah, our, our bat houses relative size um, are probably medium to small. Hopefully, you know, has at least four bats at a time, um, but both there's uh, on the front and back there's netting so there's plenty of room inside with a small lip in the front to prevent any pr predators from reaching inside the house houses um, and again there's only two in each area so we don't expect to see a drastic change but hopefully uh, one that will help the bats do who already live in the area yeah, yeah essentially it's a reallocation of the population Oh, great. When do you when do you expect to install them? Um, when the weather's much nicer. Anytime. Yeah, whenever the weather allows. Okay. Any other commissioners have uh, questions, thoughts? No. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna mention the appeal that you that you put in. Brentwood yeah, Ave. Um, we we did receive an appeal for Brentwood Ave. Um, we haven't heard from DEP um, quite yet. They said they're gonna set up a site visit um, with the um, the town engineer, um, and he was planning on giving them a call sometime this week um, to discuss it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, anything else before we go to minutes? <clears throat> no? No. Okay. Has everyone had a chance to uh, read over the minutes for December 2nd?
one comment on the presentation that was just made uh, at the end of the meeting minutes, it should be two instead of toe. So has everyone had a chance to uh, read over the minutes? Yes. Are you ready to accept them? Yes. Okay, I'll, I'll take a motion to accept the commission minutes, meeting minutes for December 2nd, 2020. Did you get my comment, Don? Sure, absolutely, Mike. Oh, I, I already said it. Did you get it? I did. I heard that. Oh, okay. Sorry. I didn't know if that... I didn't, didn't get acknowledged, so I didn't know if I... Oh, yeah. Mike, can, can you just tell me which page that's on? It's the last page. Okay. The last item. Thanks, Mike. So a motion then to accept the meeting minutes for... Approve the I'm meeting minutes for the, tw the second. Actually, uh, Valerie, I'm sorry. I'm reading the... Uh, what am I reading here? This is the memo. It's it wasn't the minutes. Oh, okay. Perfect. Because I couldn't find it. All right. Sorry, Don. Go ahead. <laughs> Not at all. I'm gonna try again. <laughs> Could I have a motion to approve the meet, meeting minutes for December second, twenty twenty? So moved. So all right, Ron, you got that one. Okay. Second. A second then, Vinny, do you want a second? Second, it? okay, second. Perfect, thank you. Uh, to the vote then, Vinny? Yes. Laura? Yes. Ron? Yes. Mike? Yes. Tom? Yes. And Don, yes. Okay. We've done it. <laughs> Once again. Yeah. Thanks for your time. We'll see you all in a, in a one. Close the meeting. Um, so the only the only way we'll get together in between is if we have a a, a real interest in in uh, meeting with the peer reviewer, and uh, we'll do that by contacting Valerie. Is that right? Yes, that's yes. right. Good, good. Okay. Could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting, please? So moved. Mark? Laura made the motion. Second. Vinny seconded the motion. Uh, Vinny, yes. Yes. Um, Laura. Yes. Ron. Yes. Tom. Yes. Mike. Yes. Don. Yes. Very good. All right. Thank you all. Sure. See you in February, if not sooner. All right. All right. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Yep. Good night, everybody.